thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you also um, to the traditional owners for the, the, you know, the Noongar for the welcome here today. And also I'd like to a special thank out to, to all our Rainbow Warriors here, Judy and, and the team who have organised this workshop. It's, it really is, it's, it's the envy of every other state that Western Australia is so proactive and, and working on this. So thank you very much for that. And I'm here representing um, yeah, University of Adelaide and, and Thylation. Got a couple of ha hats on. Um, and I'm talking about emerging technologies for individual cat management. Uh, it's probably a, a, a not a very well disguised fact that I love dissecting cats. I find it more interesting than opening Christmas presents. Every one you get is a, uh, it's exciting. And um, I, I chose this photo here for, for two reasons. One is it's probably the worst photo of a cat ever taken and it requires subtitles. But it's also, this photo was taken over 30 years ago and it was still the, the cat that I dissected that had the most um, individual animals in its stomach. So I'm sure if Sarah was doing the modelling on on number of lizards taken out by feral cats and using this as an example, it would um, yeah it would skew the results a bit. But um, like what I want to talk today about quickly is how individual cats vary and what's their preferred cat prey. You can see this one here um, had there were 24 little painted dragons in its stomach. That's one feed for one day for one cat. Um, of course, that's a sample size of n equals one. We did a bigger study here where. Uh, over 27 years in the Olympic Dam, Central South Australia area, dissected several thousand cats, um, identified yeah, th over 3,000 animals, and most importantly, compared that with the, the relative abundance of animals in the area. So through a whole lot of pitfall trapping and bird counts and opportunistic surveys, over 70,000, um, it's a big number, it's actually a shitload. We did a lot, a lot of work, and it's probably the largest data set for a region where we can comparing diet with, um, with what um, is, a, is available for cats. And I'm just going to rip through it. This, um, this is a, actually a Jacobs, selecti a Jacobs Selectivity Index, and what it varies from is, on the left-hand side, one is, is the animals are strongly selected um, relative to their relative abundance, and over this side here, that minus one is, is strongly, uh, well, not, not selected, sort of not avoided, but not selected. You can see the painted dragon, um, ironically, when we, when we looked at a whole lot more samples, actually was, is not a selected prey item. It, and yeah, nearly half of the painted dragons from that entire sample of 2,000 cats came out of that, that one cat. So that was, that was a bit skewed. The point, I, and I could talk about this f for the, the entire 15 minutes, but I'm going to get a grumpy cat thing, so I'm, I'm going to move on. <laughs> but uh, I guess the point is that cats vary a lot in, in their diet. There's another example of this too, uh, a project that uh, Catherine Mosby led, uh, reintroducing Chudich to the Flinders Ranges. And of 41 Chudich that were reintroduced, 10 of them succumbed to cat predation. Each of those um, Chudich were taken out by a large male cat, and in fact DNA swabbing of them um, revealed that four cats were responsible for it. Um, we could almost replace this um, information with a whole lot of anecdotal information of similar cat, um, prey that are difficult to hunt. Um, kakapo, marla, rock wallabies. Um, often the populations go really well for, for generations, generations of cats and generations of prey until a cat learns to hunt them and then they focus in on them. So, um, and the reason this is important is that when we're trying to target those cats, um, in, in the case of the Chudich, you went to where the, the prey was cached and you set a trap there using, and this is half a Chudich in a, in a cat trap, and this is actually the way you sort of trap those cats. So. I just wanted to point out too another example of if you know, you've got to target individuals in this, you could probably take out 95% of the cats in the Flinders Ranges or 90% of the cats where the kakapo were or the rock wallies were and make absolutely no difference to your conservation outcomes. Um, targeting those catastrophic predators is really important. Yeah, so back to this, this guy. Um, you probably wouldn't hunt this one or try and trap this one using a rabbit bait or a quoll bait. You know, this, this guy's focusing on, on hunting little dragons on the sand. Um, everyone who's looked at camera traps or Felix images knows that um, sometimes cats are really attracted to these images. So here's some, some cats that are curious and they will walk right up. Some of you might have even seen you know, like a cat eye right up into a, into a camera and things like that. And we, we don't exactly know what they're attracted to. It might be some sounds or the infrared or the flash or something like that. But some cats are naturally curious. Um, and they're the ones that are easy to trap. You can bring them right into a, a cage trap or a leg hole trap. Some cats are a little bit more nonchalant. They're sort of aware, they've had a bit of a glance over the shoulder, but um, keep on walking. Some cats uh, tend to be oblivious. And once again, these are all photographs that have come off Felix's, so the Felix that takes a photo. Anyone who can look really closely there, each three of these photos, you can actually see the gel hitting them on the flanks. 
And, um, and so they're the ones we want. They're, they're, they're really easy to feel because they're walking past at a, at a steady rate. There's another category of cats too. Once you do hit them, we've now got these little cameras in there that take multiple photos and you get some alarm cats doing a cartwheel. So that's where we know we've, we've getting them hit. So, yep, cats differ in their prey selection and the alertness, but um, yeah, this working group's obviously concerned with management and, and I guess I'm posing the question, do cats vary in response to control tools? One of the tools I'd like to talk about is the Felixer. There's quite a few talks about it, so I won't go into the, how they work, but sometimes Felixers are deployed, like in this, this first case here, uh, against a fence in a recently burnt area to remove the cats that are coming in. And by nature, that Felix has to be out in the open, and it's really obvious. In other, other occasions, you can, you can hide them in bushes and have them a lot more concealed. And a study that one of our next speakers, um, Ned, is coming to come up and, and talking in a minute, but one of the studies that he did was actually look at um, avoidance of Felixes and, and Felix crates by cats. And we found that you know around uh, a fifth of the cats initially would avoid a Felix by putting cameras on either side and, and having collars and things like that. You can see they walked around them. Um, but that declined through time, and you know, after two or three months, that declined down to you know five percent. So, just a couple of take-home messages from that is that yes, some cats show neophobia, will avoid a felixer, will avoid lots of things, but that generally declines through time. So, if you can leave it there, it helps. And Ned also found that if he could conceal the felixers, then cats were much more likely or less likely to show that neophobia. neophobia. Um, it's not only Felix, there's a whole lot of control tools um, cats are either oblivious to or, they're, um, or they, they don't uptake them. You can see here's a little eradicate sausage and a cat that's sort of just walked straight past it and I, hopefully this will work. You can see another cat come in, he actually had a look at that and then, yeah, <laughs> unfortunately the wrong one got that. So um, this is not bagging, but this happens with every control tool. They, they work for different things. And um, Michael Johnson, he's here, wave your hand, Michael. MJ's got a thousand videos of cats avoiding traps, walking up to a trap, a baited trap, even with the best bait in it, and walking away again and things like that. And I, I was going to play them, but I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to keep moving. Um, so I guess my message here is that curiosity does kill some cats, but wariness also saves them. And so um, this is a challenge that if we're managing cats and managing cats sustainably, we need to um, be aware of. And so, as it's been mentioned several times, multiple tools and variability of deployment is really optimal for sustained cat control. Don't just stick to the same recipe because there are some cats you won't get. Um, a few little light bulb moments. Um, all cats are individuals. It's not all feral cats. I'm talking about all cats at the moment, and so are cat owners. There's a lot of individuality with cat owners. Some of us might have heard this, the expression, my cat doesn't wander or hunt or spray or fight or anything like that. Some people acknowledge they do. But many cats, whether they're pet, stray or feral, are very smart and they learn and they resist management. You can trap a cat once, but you're not going to trap it again. And you speak to a lot of rangers and animal welfare people, they, oh geez, I thought you were showing me the two minute sign then, I nearly jumped. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we've already been through this before, um, several people have already mentioned it, cats transition from, from pet to feral to pet again. And um, so, yeah, I'm suggesting we might take the F out of that and we, we start looking at um, cats in general. So we need to manage cats as individuals and not as a numbers game. Um, reducing 80% of the cats or 70% of the cats might not have the benefit you want for your numbats or your fairy turns or, or whatever it is. Um, it's really important to distinguish individual cats and their predictive tray. And it's also really important to develop and adapt management tools to target those individuals. And fortunately, there's, there's two things. Community support, we've already talked about, and emerging technology can help with this. Um, here's a data set that um, Adrian Wayne and Marika Maxwell from DBCA provided with some cats that identified going, tediously going through and identifying individuals. And we had an honours student, uh, Louis D'Antonio, then ran that through a, a machine learning thing and showed that machine learning could also identify those individuals and they, they clustered out, which is really, um, really good. And, and I, Ideally and optimally, that will improve and the, the speed of identifying individual cats. That's all done offline, though. And um, so artificial intelligence, including machine learning, can identify cats from wildlife, which is really important. And it can also identify most individual cats um, by their patterns. Not all, but most. But the future is more exciting than that. Um, this is a, one of the new model Felixes, the 3.2. There are two different things on it that I want to highlight. One is it's got a new GPS and uh, Bluetooth antenna on it, and that enables us to identify individual um, pets with, with Bluetooth tags on them. 
And also, also got an edge AI camera. So artificial intelligence, if it's, if it's mounted in the device and it's doing everything at the time immediately, it's called edge AI. And that's actually taking 10 frames a second. And so rather than just relying on the, on the beams to distinguish targets from non-targets, we're now taking 10 photos um, every second. And you can see here, you can see a cat walking into frame. By the time we get to the second or third frame, yep, we're pretty sure that's a cat. It's a cat. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. What happens? Are we going to get it? Yes, we did. You can see the cat responding to that. And what this does, um, instead of just using single images, we're actually using multiple images for that. And as the cat is moving, you can see what I've circled, you know, some distinctive leg markings. Sometimes you need two or three or four or five photos to be able to get all those markings or see if the tail's banded or something like that. Also using a, a video enables you to use gate as well as just a pat, you can use the gate to, um, to identify individual animals. And because that's on the edge, because you're doing that in real time, you can trigger management. So we can trigger management by squirting, squirting with a Felix. So we can also trigger management by opening a gate or delivering a bait or a whole lot of different tools. So it's a really exciting development. Um, using this Edge AI, we've, um, in the past, when Felix's first came out, we had about a 5% non-target um, rate and around a 50% targeting rate. Um, this Edge AI has moved that right up to 0.5, so this, this bottom red star is at, at 0.5 false positive rate, so that means one in 200 um, wildlife are considered to be a target. Um, and just in the space of two months, we collected some data, retrained it, and we've pushed that right up to like 0.01%. So, so we're, um, this, this scale here, that's 5%, that's not 50%, so this is a lot more target specific than, than a lot of other um, cat management tools, and we actually can record every one. We're also pushing up the identification. It's very frustrating. Anyone who's used a Felix and sees a cat go past, it doesn't fire, you go, oh, I couldn't get it. Um, it doesn't fire in some cases because it doesn't recognise it as a cat, but in some cases it's either moving too fast to get hit or it's moving on an angle and it will get a, a, a sort of a glancing blow. And that's what that line at 76%, we reckon 24% of them shouldn't be fired on at all and we're pushing up towards that. So. Yeah, it should be within a little while, we should be up around that 76% of cats coming past will get fired. And um, yeah, the 0.5 false targeting rate is, is actually really important too. Felix is likely to be registered with the APVMA finally in about a week's time. And they've set that 0.5 false targeting as a, as a, as a limit. And uh, yeah, we're, we're under that now and we're getting better. Um, Another way of using artificial intelligence, um, or not us, but another technology for managing cats is looking at pet cats. And there's already quite a few talks today about the, the grey zone between pet cats and stray cats and feral cats. I strongly believe that we need to manage our pet cats and we need to, you know, with enforcement as well, in order to manage, you know, strays and ferals as well. So ADEMA stands for the, the Automatic Detection, Identification and Management of Animals. Two minutes, here we go. And so here's a concept where we've got these little tags. You put on a cat, it only weighs 10, 10 grams, and the councils can have their cats registered. The tags last for 12 months, and we can manage cats, we can identify cats without having to trap the cats and all the animal welfare issues associated with that. Also, we have to make sure that we benefit cat owners. We, we want this to be a positive thing for cats, so cat owners can find, it, can find their cat if it goes missing without sticking up a poster in the bus stop, and they can look at its health and things like that by its temperature. These little tags are tiny little things. Cats love wearing them. Owners love them. <laughs> you can put a detector on a rubbish truck. Trucks drive up and down every house you know, once a week, and you can use that to detect where cats are, if they're at their registered address or if they're not, and you can help to enforce if cats have gone into a into a no cat zone. Um, I really want to make a point that a lot of people assume that cat owners are the, are the people we, we need to convince. People who really care, generally care about cats and are prepared to cuddle the bloody things like these people, um, <laughs> really want cats to be looked after. They, they, they care about them and they, they really want a distinction between owned cats and unowned cats. I know all of these people and I can, I can guarantee it. Um, Having cats with identifications also enables you to, to use tools to manage them separately. So, so here's a photograph. This is actually taken by Felix. It doesn't matter, but this was, this was targeted as a cat. Um, we didn't fire on it. It was just a photograph. But if we knew, if we were 80% sure that it had no collar, if we were 40% sure it wasn't a distinctive local pet, or, and we were pretty sure it was a bandicoot killer, and we we're 100% sure it didn't have a tag on it, then authorities would be much more likely to say, righto, let's manage this cat, rather than it's, it's just a obscure cat. 
That, that Felix photo was taken in exactly the same place and just a day before this one. This is a pet cat that was wearing a tag, it was identified as a, as a tagged cat and it was, it was blocked. So a couple of quick take home messages, get the F out of the, um, this, we, let's treat cats together. Um, let's, you know, it's been mentioned before, I've got an angry cat. So individual cats uh, vary in appearance. Um, yeah, pet cats could and should be distinguished from strays and ferals, and we should be managing own cats as distinct from feral cats. Yep, and that's all I've got time for. Thank you.